1 John chapter 4, 7 through 12, and 19 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God has, was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. Verse 19. We love because He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has, he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from Him, whoever love God, loves God must also love his brother. The grass withers and the flower fades. Well, it's good to be back with you all. It's only been two and a half years since I've been in this pulpit. <laughs> so it's a joy to uh, serve you this morning, uh, bring the word. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, the great chapter in the Bible on love. And I've entitled it, God is love, and God loves you. Now, this is very common Thing to be thinking about, love, right? And, but what does it actually look like? What does it mean? And so we're beginning, beginning down into that a little bit more, and uh, hopefully this will challenge us a little bit, as well as assure us and, and bless us. So God is love, God loves you. In 1965, Jackie DeShannon recorded a song that became a huge hit, What the World needs now is love. Still true. This is how it starts. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there is too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not for some, but for everyone. The same is true today. Even this morning as we walk in here, every one of us needs love. Nobody's being loved enough. At least we don't think so. <laughs> you know, marriages are challenging. Raising kids are challenging. Just meeting as adults, is, it's all challenging. And how do we love one another? How do we love our children? How do we love our spouses? You know, this word we toss around, love, is so easily tossed around, but the reality is we need more love. We need to understand what that looks like, what that means. What does it mean to love one another? We all need to be loved more. We all need to love more. We both need to be giving it and receiving it. That's how God has built us. We're a part of the body of Christ, where we're known by the way we love one another. And our hearts all long. There's nobody in here that doesn't long to be loved in a biblical way, in a right way, a healthy way. We all long for that in our hearts because that's the way we were created. It's the way God has intended things to be. In uh, the garden, there was wonderful love going on between God and man. Then the fall occurred, and all of a sudden, things weren't perfect anymore. And we all needed love. We still need that. So during the recent pandemic, many people have experienced increased isolation. And the result of that isolation is less love. We need each other to be loving each other in order to build one another up and just function, just feel good about ourselves, about each other. We need each other. This is mean, what it means to be part of the body of Christ. And the world needs to be loved by us. And so because of the isolation and the things that, that took place, 
there was a huge increase in the number of people who sought counseling. A lot of you know my youngest son is in seminary right now, and he's dual majoring for counseling and for an MDiv. And so in his counseling classes, he's been seeing and understanding more and more what it means to love other people, but also to minister to people who are in great need of love. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is love? If I were to ask you to write down what is the definition of love, I think it would be interesting. We take up all the papers, we'll see what the answers are. But what we need to do is to be loving the way the Bible tells us how to love. How do we know when we are loving versus, you know, what does the Bible say? What does love really look like? You see, love is not just an emotional feeling. And so often the songs that we hear in public and many of them are produced and they, they make it all about a feeling. Do you feel loved? Do you feel not loved? This word feel kind of gets in, in there. But it's true that the emotions are engaged, but they're not the only thing. You know, people fall in love. People fall out of love. Well, is that how we're to think about love? So Paul's writing here in 1 Corinthians 13, the great chapter on love, to help us understand what love really looks like. When are you loving and when are you not loving? Because we all get a little confused sometimes. <laughs> all of us. There's no exceptions. And so as we look into this great love chapter in the Bible, hopefully it'll help us to understand what love is and what it's not. I've divided the chapter into three sections, verses one through three, tell us that love should be the foundation and motivation of all our relationships. Verses four through seven tell us what love is and what love is not. That's really helpful. Verses eight through 13 tell us the permanence of love. So we're going to look at what these three sections teach us and then we're going to apply these teachings to our hearts. We're going to see that love is a verb. It's an action, it's something that we do, that we take heart in in a relationship with God and each other. So, that in mind, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 13. You'll find it on page 959 in your pew Bibles. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this challenge that we have before us. We all know in our hearts that we're not very good at loving much of the time. And we really need your help, your grace, 
your forgiveness, your instruction, and how to love in ways that will please you and bless those who are around us. So please move mightily in our hearts this morning. Stir us, encourage us, convict us if that's necessary, but help us to love more like you love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So Paul was writing to a a young church at Corinth, one that was full of all kinds of things that were not right, wrong, and not loving one another. They were a relationship mess, all right? Let's call it like it is. And uh, it was needful for him then to uh, come and instruct them. And so on this 13th chapter in uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, he's addressing this, what is known as the love chapter in the Bible. They were using, well, should we say, they were misusing their spiritual gifts all over the place. Now, in chapter uh, 13, 1 through 3, he makes his first point. The importance of love. Love is to be the foundation and the motivation for their relationships with one another. That's what they need to understand and know. What does that mean? He tells them that they need to look into their hearts and ask themselves, why am I using my spiritual gifts? Is it because I'm motivated by love for others? Or is it to make me feel superior or proud? How great I am. When I was in seminary, we attended New Life Glenside Church where Dr. Jack Miller had started uh, a hugely successful sonship course, which was very well known in the late 80s and into the early 90s. And... Uh, it was a great blessing in that church, and many people were, were learning many things about what it meant to, meant to love the Lord and, and to see uh, how to serve and encourage one another. And so what they found at the Sonship Course really focused on what the gospel truly is. What does it mean to live out the gospel? What does it mean to interact with one another in a gospel-centered way? And so when I started attending, I was amazed that they had stopped teaching Sonship. Seemed like a really great thing to know about, understand how to live out the Christian life, how to love one another, how to love God. And so as people had learned all this, then all of a sudden their pride kicked in. And they started using it in the wrong ways. They started uh, questioning whether or not you know, have you taken sonship? Because I have. And therefore, I'm better than you are. And that was pretty difficult. Obviously, that's not the idea behind sonship, but this is how they were twisting it. And, uh, and so it became the motive was to, for their own glory rather than to see the love of God moving in each other's lives. And so as that uh, unfolded, they stopped teaching sonship because of that. They said, wait a minute, time out. People are misapplying this. So we can take anything and twist it, right? I mean, that's the human heart. Even the best of things, we can twist it and make it about our own self-glory. And so loving motives always attempts to use gifts to glorify Jesus Christ and not ourselves. But it's so easy because our fallen nature, our sin nature, wants to glorify self. And we do it all the time. Sometimes subtly, sometimes we're not understanding that we're doing it. Other times, because we want people to think well of us. And so we bring glory to ourselves. So our object then is to glorify Jesus. And so some of the Corinthians you see here, they aren't using their gifts at all. Do you know what the opposite of love is? What's the opposite of love? It's apathy. Or indifference. So when you're, it's, it's not hate. So when you're not caring about people, you're not using your gifts, then you're not pleasing God, you're not loving. And so these people needed to use their gifts in a loving way, in a knowledgeable way, so that others are built up and encouraged as part of the body of Christ. So why do we love? 1 John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. We love because he first loved us. It's the love of God that should compel us 
to love him and others. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave us his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Love motivated God to send Jesus. And Jesus loved the Corinthians by dying in their place on the cross for their sins. God gave up his son in order that they might have life. And so they should be loving one another by being willing to lay down their lives for one another. Love should be the foundation and motivation for all they said and did. Now let's look at our second point. What is love and what is not love? The way the world uses the word love can mean many things. In verses 4 through 7, Paul instructed them what God's definition of love is. So get ready. <laughs> you know, look at your own hearts as we're looking at this, and you can see how much you're loving or how much you're struggling with loving. So this was very helpful for them because it helped them understand if they were loving or not, or whether they're being loved or not, whichever side of the spectrum you're on. So Paul says love is patient and kind. This is what it is. It rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Paul was primarily addressing relationships between church members, but it can apply to all relationships. It doesn't have to be restricted to the church. And as they experienced how patient and kind God was with them, then they should be patient and kind with one another. For example, after God rescued the Israelites from Egypt and they rebelled against him, yet he provided them with food and clothing in the desert for 40 years and still led them into the promised land. God's love is patient. God's love is kind. God's love sends us Jesus to pay for the sins that we've committed. Now let's see what Paul says love is not. It does not envy or boast. Do you ever envy or boast? It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. That means that whenever they envied or boasted, they were not loving. That's true for us as well today. Whenever they were arrogant or rude, they were not loving. Whenever they insisted on their own way, they were not loving. Whenever they were irritable or resentful, they were not loving. And so we can take these self-tests, can't we? We can look at our own hearts and see what is our intention. They were not loving when they rejoiced with wrongdoing. Unfortunately, they were not loving very much. The whole church is known for its pride and its lack of love for one another. Self was being elevated throughout the whole church. And that brings us to our third point in verses 8 through 13. The love of God is permanent. God's love never ends. Never stops. Never changes. That means that we can go before God knowing that we're going to be perfectly loved all the time. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? We can be confident in that. We are his children. We come before him as beloved children. It says all their gifts would cease, but never God's love for them. Faith and hope, all these things would pass. But God's love will never pass. This morning you are God's treasure and delight. You're the apple of his eye. You're the ones who are worth dying for in his eyes. It's impossible for God to stop loving you. It's important for you to know that this morning. It's impossible for God to stop loving you. He sent his son to prove that. So now let's apply these truths that we're finding in 1 Corinthians. Love is a verb. 
When you love, it's an action that you take or a word that you speak with an attitude in your heart of trying to bless the other person. It always requires action on our part, even if it's just words. But it can also be physical things where we help our neighbors out, help our families out. Love always glorifies Jesus. And that should be the motive for using our gifts and how we relate to one another to glorify Christ because he's first loved us. So what do we do then when we see that we're not loving? Because we all see when we're not loving. We don't see all the time when we're not loving. But it comes to our attention from time to time from other people around us when it's clearly shown that, you know, I'm not loving you very well right now. So 1 John 3, 1 through 2 gives us the answer of how we're to handle ourselves. It says, see or behold what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. So when we see that we're unloving, we're to repent. Not always the most fun thing for any of us to do. We have to acknowledge that we've sinned, that we're sinners. But we are to repent. We're to go before God. We have a place to go with our sin. We don't just have to sit here and say, oh, I feel bad about myself. Woe is me. I'm a worm. I'm terrible. I'm horrible. No. It's not what God wants. He wants us to turn to him and admit our sin to him, confess it to him, and uh, knowing that he will take that, and that's going to be laid on Jesus and not on you. Isn't that amazing? It's the most incredible thing, because we all sin. But it doesn't stop there. God glorifies his name as we handle this the right way and go to him and repent and turn to Jesus in faith. And when we turn to the person of Jesus, we behold the great love that the Father has given to us. You see how great you're loved because your sin is not going to stop you from having this personal relationship, this eternal relationship with the Lord. You're going to live forever in his presence. What a glorious thing that is. Songs about that. Behold what manner the love of God has given unto us. Doesn't that resonate in your soul? It's like, wow, yeah, that is so good. Because, you know, I see my sin a lot. And this is a glorious and a wonderful thing to bask in the presence and the glory of God and his love, who has forgiven my sins, who has removed them as far as the west is from the east. And so we remember who we are. We're children of God. It's important to remember who you are. So often we forget that. We just live our lives out. There's pressure. There's things going on. Tensions in our lives. And we forget who we are. Children of God. We also forget that we need to uphold and encourage one another. But we need to know our identity. We're children of God. That's who I am. Everyone who knows Christ is a child of God. And we need to hold on to that securely. You know, as my children would leave for school... Every single morning as they were heading out the door, I would ask them the same question every day. Who are you? You know, they weren't just somebody going to school. And they'd always give me the right answer. A little coaching to start out with. I'm a child of God. They needed to know who they were. They're a child of God. So we got that firmly placed in their psyche day by day over time. I'm a child of God. Now sometimes they go, oh dad, come on, we've said this over and over. I know, but we're going to continue to do this. Who are you? I'm a child of God. So when they left for school, no matter what they were going to run into, they knew who they were. They weren't looking for other people's approval, they were looking for God's approval. They weren't looking for ways to uh, get excitement and things in their lives that weren't in line with God's will because they were children of God. They wanted to please their father. So 
We're to see and behold the love of our Father in heaven, and that he gave us his son Jesus to die in our place. But Jesus has died for everyone that knows Christ. He's died for all the children that are in the households of faith. And that's important to always remember that. He's already suffered for our sins so that we could be identified as children of God. Our loving Father did not hold back his greatest treasure and his greatest delight, his son, Jesus Christ. You are worth dying for. Do you realize that this morning? Everybody in here that knows Christ is worth dying for. Anybody in here who does not know Christ, come on! Don't you want to be valued and and loved like that? Declaration of God's love for you that you are worth dying for. Who else in this world are you worth dying for? You are his treasured possession. So God sent his son in order to gain you and to gain me. What an amazing thing. We have that song we sing, right? Amazing love. How can it be? God died for me. We all sing that. It resonates in our hearts when we sing that. Amazing love. And he accomplished what he was sent to do. He who knew no sin became sin in order that we might become children of God. And he accomplished that. And look what else happens when you behold your father's love gift of Jesus. You are reminded that he's coming back. Sometimes we forget that. We get our eyes on the things that are keeping us busy every day getting our attention, keeping us looking at things of this world, but we need to step back. This is why it's so good here on Sunday mornings as we get our eyes focused back on the fact Jesus is returning. This is not the end of the story, this life we have here. We've got an eternal life. Eternal life is what we have to be in his presence forevermore. And so when we see him as he is, then we start to become more and more like him. Isn't that glorious? We don't just stay the same. We're all growing and maturing and as we're being sanctified day by day, the more we can keep our eyes on the Lord and see how much love he has for us, then the more we grow in likeness of him. Because when we're in his presence, there's no sin. And he takes away your sin. He takes away my sin. And we're going to enjoy eternal life with him. These are the promises. These are the assurances. These are things that cannot change. You're going to be transformed into Christ likeness. I'm going to be transformed into Christ likeness. And when the whole thing is finished, I will be like him. Right now, we still struggle. We see through a glass darkly, the scriptures say. But God's not finished. The end hasn't come. We are Jesus' treasures. And he's going to finish the job when he comes back. Isn't that glorious? Yeah, amen, right? Amen. And you're going to love like God loves. You're going to love like Jesus loves. And the fruit of love that God has bestowed upon us is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. And we're going to be in him throughout eternity. We're going to be part of the body of Christ. We're going to behold the love of God in the person of Jesus Christ, who we're experiencing a personal relationship with this morning. Jesus loves you. He's here right now in spirit. He's delighting in you. He knows every bit of your body. He knows every bit of your thinking. He knows the, everything about you and more than you know about yourself. And he loves you. And he's not going to change his mind. Isn't that glorious? So you're not to get down on yourself. You're to take your sins to him. Confess them. And he will take care of them. It's not enough to just intellectually know about God and about his son. It's not enough to be able to intellectually know about justification and sanctification and glorification and adoption. These are all great things. You know, I learned all about those in seminary. I can give you the definitions. But that's not enough. 
That's wonderful stuff to know. But we need to personally experience beholding Jesus. To behold and see the love of the Father means to have intellectual truth flooded by our emotions. It doesn't stop with intellectual knowledge. It doesn't stop here. It's got to get to here. God so loved the world. It wasn't up here. It was here as well, both. And that's what moved him because of his great love for us. So he sent his son to save unworthy sinners like us because of what he thought, what he felt, that he loved us. Doesn't even make sense. I don't know why. I can't answer that question. But he does. He's decided to do that, and he's never going to change his mind. And so when we see and behold how much we're loved, it should cause wonder to rise in our hearts. Why do you love me so much? Why are you never going to change your mind? But we can rest in that. I can remember when I was a young Christian that I struggled with my faith. It seemed like it was there one day and not there in the next. And so the Lord put it on my heart to memorize Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which I imagine most of the people in this room right now could probably quote most of it, at least know what it says in in one sense. You know, I, I began to personalize it. I said, Father... So I'm speaking, I'm, instead of just quoting the scripture, I'm saying I, right? I'm Father, I'm personally talking to God. Father, I will trust in you with all my heart. I will not lean on my own understanding. In all my ways I will acknowledge you, and you will make straight my paths. I repeated this prayer over and over and over, multiple times a day throughout the day. I was really looking to the Lord, and he was the answer. I could not do this in my own strength. I couldn't trust with all my heart and my own strength. And so I was looking to the Lord. I was seeking God to bring this reality into my heart. And after a couple of months, this didn't happen the next day. (laughs) took a couple of months. I still remember it. Anyway, after I was doing it for a couple of months, I was walking down the street of one of the streets in Salt Lake City, of all places, and uh, I was there with a business friend, when all of a sudden the Spirit of God just... Boom, resonated in my heart. And all of a sudden, I knew that I knew that I knew that I trusted God. There was something miraculous that took place, and the presence of God is what accomplished that. And so there was a feeling of emotion and excitement that gripped my heart. I was so excited, I could hardly stand it. I felt like I was walking three feet up off the ground down the street of Salt Lake City. It was amazing. From that day on, I've never doubted trusting God since. And I've wondered about circumstances, and I've wondered why they're happening, and I didn't understand it. But the basic trust of faith that God was working all things together for my good, that never was a problem ever again. But God did that. And that's what he wants to do for all of us. So I rejoiced in the love of God and what he had done. And you know what? I couldn't stop thanking him. I couldn't stop. I mean, for I used to keep a journal. I don't keep it anymore, but I used to keep a prayer journal. And, uh, and in there, I just saw for the next couple of months, every entry, it was like almost the only thing was there, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's never any doubt now in my mind. You're there, you're going to watch over me, you've got plans to save me and take me all the way to heaven. And so my rejoicing was just going on and on and on. This is what God delights to do. He wants to do it in all of our hearts. I guess that was like 36 years ago. (laughs) It's amazing. Anyway, 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. He's not just loving, he is love. And that's important. It's impossible for him to do anything except love. And we need to see that and understand that. It's impossible for him not to love you. So whenever you have done something wrong, whenever something's happened that you're not very proud of, 
whenever you sin, God's love will never stop. He doesn't like what you do, but you don't hide from him. You run to him. You run to him and confess your sin. Because Jesus has already paid the price for that sin. He's already paid the price. And so that makes me feel safe rather than want to hide. It makes, no, it makes me realize that I'm in the presence of perfect love, eternal love, and it's never going to change. God so loved the world that he was motivated to send his son. This is love. Perfect Jesus was sent to become sin and die in your place, in my place. I, I hope that resonates in your heart. Because sometimes it takes a while to go from here to here, right? That's how much you're loved. And not only that, he was willing to pay the price for that sin. It wasn't just an intellectual thing. It was something that was of the heart. and brought permanent change to all who will call upon him. It was because he loves us so much. So when you were a sinner, Jesus loved you, and he's never going to change his mind. So when you sin now, he's not going to change his mind. He wants you to run to him and ask for forgiveness and ask to be changed. That's our proper reaction to sin. So Jesus' death was required in order for that to take place. Do you see Jesus suffering on the cross this morning for you? Do you see him dying for you? This is love. This is love. He dies for you. Physically dies. Has that gripped your heart yet? Are you excited that Jesus lavishly loves you, wants to guide you and direct you in all love? Do you see the extent of the cost that Jesus paid in order for you to be called a child of God? Is you are God's child if you know him? Are you looking forward to Christ's return when you will love like he loves? Isn't that amazing? When Jesus returns, you're going to love like he loves. You're never going to sin again. It's going to be an amazing thing. And you will experience for the first time what it means to be loved without any kind of sin blocking the way inside of you. It's going to be gone. It's going to be removed. And you'll see him face to face. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be wonderful. Better than anything you've ever experienced. Because right now we see through a glass darkly what 1 Corinthians 13 says, right? But then you'll see him as he is. But you'll be changed. You'll be like him. Sin nature will be removed. And you will be beholding amazing love. And that re makes me recall the, the song, Amazing Love, which I think kind of carries the sense of what we're talking about here. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my king, should die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true that it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. I hope those words just rise in your heart right now and just resound with joy. That they're real. And may the Lord powerfully move in all of our hearts. Powerfully move in all of our hearts. So that this church may be known by the way that we love one another. It's not just something up here. It's something down here as well. It's both. They have true love for one another, willingness to lay our lives down for one another, willing to be Christ-like with one another. May that take place. And as we partake in communion in just a moment, may God reveal his amazing love for you in a deeper and a fresher way than ever before. There's always more for us this side of heaven. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you and praise you for this great love that you have for us. We ask that you would continue to work in our hearts, that we might more and more grow in our love for you and for each other. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy as you work in our hearts day by day. And we look forward to the return of your son when all of this will go away. In Jesus' name, amen.